Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. This is part four in the Macintosh Color Classic Repair Series. If you haven't seen parts one, two, and three, I recommend you watch those first. I'll put links in the description below so you can check those out. There'll be stuff in part four here that won't make much sense unless you've watched those previous parts first. In this video, I'm going to get the sound working on this machine, and I'm also going to get the network stack working and try out some games and programs and stuff on here. So without further ado, let's get right to it. Just for a quick recap, in the last part, I took the 68040 LC575 motherboard that Tekokami sent me and I recapped it. The performance of the motherboard is amazing. It runs so much faster than the old original processor in this computer, but there seems to be a problem. There is sound coming out of the headphone jack on the motherboard, but there is none out of the internal speaker. So let's figure that out. I was starting to get frustrated that it was impossible to probe this board with it in the chassis, but then I moved the computer and I felt the underside with my fingers and thought, uh, I could just turn the computer on its side and have access to every pin on the connector here. And then a lot of the signals as well are available on the bottom side of the board. So pff, why didn't I think of this earlier? Now, unfortunately, there's no schematics for this particular motherboard. The Bowmark ones I was using doesn't include this particular LC motherboard, but the pinout obviously on the connector is the same as on the Color Classic. So I could just look to the Color Classic schematics to at least check the signals on here to see if say the audio is getting out of here or check the voltage rails things like that. So I'm gonna start by checking the voltage rails. We got 12 point or 11.9, so that's really good. What's this brown wire here? Hmm, that's not any, that's showing nothing, zero volts. I wonder what that wire is, obviously. Ground, and these two are five volts, 4.97, so those are looking good. Someone mentioned the power supply in this machine is not very powerful and may not be able to run everything like this 040 processor, but seems to be having no issue at all. Although I gotta look up what this brown wire is because I'm getting absolutely nothing on that. And if that's supposed to be like a minus five volts, I wonder if that has something to do with the reason why the, um, the sound isn't working on the other boards. What if it's the analog board all along? How crazy would that be? Okay, so I've checked the schematics and the power connector up here has a brown wire, which I thought might be a different voltage rail. But when I probe it, I'm getting zero. But I looked in the schematics and the brown and the black wire are both just ground. And then there's 12 volts and five volts here. Basically this power supply is giving good power, perfect voltage levels on the main connector. And then I figured out that this pin right here is the minus five volts and I'm getting minus 4.98. That is from the analog board and that is for the audio circuitry. So that is good. And I'm just probing around in the sound circuitry side of the motherboard here and like there's minus 4.8 volts. So like the, the negative voltage rails are making its way over to here. I mean, they have to be because we're getting proper sound out of the headphone jack. We're just not getting sound through the analog board, which will be through this connector right here uh, into the analog board. All right, I booted up Microsoft Flight Simulator because it has a constant sound. It's like a propeller sound and it is coming out of the headphone jack right now. So I know that's good because I need to look in this pinout here to find the audio signal just to see if it's making its way over to that board. And looking at the schematics, this is from the Color Classic, but here's that connector, the middle one, 56, 60, and 42. Those are the three pins that come from the sound chip that go up to this board. I'm not sure what those signals are. One of those, one or two of those has gotta be audio. Now, I know up here is pin one, and this is 100 because uh, there's 100 pins here. So we saw 60, so it's gonna be somewhere in the middle here. So I just kinda of need to poke and try to find that signal. Okay, I found a signal that I think is around pin 60 and it looks like it could be sound. So I'm gonna plug in the speakers. Well, it certainly changes when I plug in, <laughs> it, it, it goes down, that's for sure. So it's definitely being affected. That one is not. That one is right there, uh, as is that one. Let's see when I plug this in, does it go down to not? Yep, it goes down, but it's really, really low. 
Like, there's just not a lot of signal there. Okay, if I quit out of the game, will that go away? Or actually, I can turn the volume down on the front. It's all precarious here. Let's see. Oh, look. Yeah, that's it. That's the sound wave, definitely. Oh, look, I turned the volume up and it gets louder. So that looks a lot more like an audio signal, doesn't it? But it's we're looking at maybe one volt peak to peak. But when I plug in, it's like it doesn't even go away. It's uh, I'm going to quit out of the game and let's see if that goes away. OK, yeah, so that's clearly the audio signal. Now, it's very, very low. I mean, I don't know what the audio amp is expecting. Of course, it can be a low level, but it's got an AC component to it, about a volt. And then as soon as we plug in the speakers, that goes away. And I am seeing this on two different pins. So I was seeing the audio on pin 56 and 60. I'm wondering if maybe what I should do is try... Uh, so my biggest problem at the moment is I don't know what the audio should look like on these pins. Like, is the signal we're seeing here normal or is this not normal? On the Color Classic 56 and 60, both go directly into the sound chip. So the headphone jack, which is this one here, even though it says microphone jack, that is wrong on the schematics. The schematics are incorrect. Um, they are, it's routed, the audio is routed between the speaker, you know, going to the, the connector there or the headphone jack, obviously by the sound chip itself. So there could easily be a fault in this sound chip as well, especially because there was all, there was some corrosion around the pins that could be causing this particular issue. All right, I'm making some progress. So I was looking around the board with the oscilloscope, just looking for the sound signal. So right now there is a sound coming out of the computer, but I have the speakers turned down. So the jack is in here. Um, if I look on this connector here, and we turn up the oscilloscope. There's, that's the actual sound. It's like a jet engine sound coming out of the game. That is the sound actually happening. Now, when I take a look at this pin right here, it's got five volts on it. When I pull out the connector, it drops down, but it's still a little bit too high. But the weird thing is, if I hold the connector at a weird angle, I hear the jet sound out of the speaker. If I push it in all the way, it's up at five volts. If I pull it out all the way, it's kind of up around, I don't know, that's maybe a volt and a half. But when I put this in partially, it's down right around ground and I hear the audio. Now if I, there's the sound waveform, and if I pull it out, it jumps up. Still the sound is there, but it jumps up, you know, and we don't hear the sound anymore. So does that mean that there is a problem with this connector? I don't know. Quite possible, right? In there, there we go, it's high. And then, and then this pin here, when it's in, it's at ground. And when I pull it out partially, when I put it out all the way, it's up here around, uh, you know, I don't know, volt and a half up with the waveform. And partially in, all the way in, it's like that. If I pull it out a little bit, there's the actual signal and it's at the right level, but we're still hearing no sound. And if I move the jack around, it starts working. I'm really thinking that there's something just physically wrong with this, this audio jack here, that that's the entire problem. So it's time for some deoxit and I'm just gonna slam this connector in here full of deoxit like that. And then I'm just gonna get this in and out of there a whole bunch of times. Well, Deoxid didn't fix this, and um, but it looks like the headphone jack on this dead motherboard, this is the, the battery leak one, is exactly the same. It's got the same pin out and everything. So I'm gonna pull it off here. I'm gonna pull that one off, and then we'll see if swapping that fixes this darn board. So swapping out the headphone jack had no effect whatsoever. It's exactly the same symptoms, whatever. It's doing exactly the same thing. And there's no way that both jacks are bad in the same way. So something else is going on. 
I started poking and prodding and finding the signals as they go around the board. Like there's a couple of resistors here that come from the headphone jack. And the headphone jack on here is definitely working correctly. I figured out that signals go from the jack. When you pull out the headphone jack, it, it loops around through it, goes through a pair of resistors right here, and then right over to this part of the connector, you know, up into the analog board. And yet, as you see right here, no sound, right? We should be hearing the, the prop sound. So I have been clipping the oscilloscope ground lead, which I have on this um, clip here, onto either right here, which is the ground coming off the power supply, or I was actually clipping it onto a piece of metal on the power supply board, on, on the shielding of the power supply board. Those are the two spots I was getting the ground from. Well, as I was probing around, the ground lead had fallen off, and I went to clip it right here onto the SCSI connector, and watch what happens. We have sound. There's the propeller sound coming out of the speaker. And when I pull it off, it's gone. And remember when I had sound earlier, I realized what was different. I had the zip drive connected to the SCSI connector. Okay. All right. So that in and of itself allowed the sound to work, but there's a reason why, and I figured it out. So it turns out, and I hadn't noticed this up until this point, that Apple did something that probably was for RFI emissions. They split the ground plane on this motherboard into multiple sections. So on the power cable that comes from the power supply, there are the two ground leads that go to this connector here. And this ground, this ground goes all over the motherboard to all the digital circuits, the processor and the connector, the, the ribbon cables here, and the RAM, and all, all throughout here, that's where that ground is. But, but there's a second ground plane, and this little metal thing right here uh, that touches the what was the RF shield before that, and this, and this one, those are electrically isolated from the main digital ground. You see the power supply board right here, and it has this metal uh, shield right there, and also this thing on the back. These are actually connected electrically to the ground wires right here on the power connector. That means that the digital ground that's all here and this board here are actually the same. Well, remember that original RF shield that was on this computer? It covered the whole bottom right here. That meant that all these little metal things like here and here would have been touching that. And then that looped around and wrapped up, went up this cage here and was making contact with this metal shield. Well, it turns out that the headphone jack and the audio output circuitry is using this isolated ground that's on this section of the board. And because the RF shield is missing, there is no longer a connection up to the power supply anymore. So if I take a clip lead here and I clip it on to the headphone jack right here, just the metal part, and I touch it to the power supply here, <laughs> we get sound. So the sound on this motherboard is not working through the speaker because very specifically, the RF shield is missing. So why was the sound working when I had a SCSI device connected? Well, there's a reason. The shielding on this connector here, see the screws here and this metal part, this is on the isolated ground. Meanwhile, there are ground pins inside of this connector in these 25 pins, and those are on the ground plane of all the digital circuitry. When I plug the zip drive into this, it obviously connects the shielding here to the ground pins that are in this 25 pin connector, which is typical. That's just the way it works. So the zip drive was creating that ground path to allow the audio circuitry in the analog board or in the power supply board to actually work. So how do I fix this problem? It's pretty easy, actually. I just need to connect the ground planes together. And there's a, there's a gap here, here, and there. And I'm just going to join those, and that will fix this problem once and for all. Just using a little bit of sandpaper to sand away the solder mask to expose the copper below. And then getting it good and hot so I tin it with some fresh solder. And actually using some of the little metal pieces that were used to originally touch the RF shield to bridge across the two ground planes. It's not the prettiest thing in the world. On this one I just cut the little loop, bent it over to the other side. Over here, they were so close together, I was able just to put a bead of solder to join those two together. This one here, I should have cut this down a little more, but it's a really good solid connection. 
I cut the little loop off there and I used it to join those together. And because I had scratched away some of the solder mask and uh, some of the actual copper was exposed, I put a little bit of lacquer on top of that just to kind of seal that in. All right, so this motherboard now should actually work and have <laughs> proper sound. Let's try it. And this is it, the moment of truth. Let me push the power button. <laughs> and it works. It freaking, freaking works. It's the first time in my life where the RF shield was used for anything other than just shielding. Apple actually used it to connect part of the grounds to the power supply. That seems bonkers to me, but lesson learned. And also if anyone ever is working on one of these Macs and you take the RF shield off to access the motherboard on the bottom side, like I'm doing here, you're gonna have the same problem. At the minimum, take a clip lead and clip it onto one of those ground loops that touch the RF shield and then clip that onto the metal shielding that's under the power supply and then you should have working sound, but unbelievable. You know, that begs the question, are the sound problems with the original classic motherboard related to this phenomenon? And taking a look at the bottom here, it's using that same, same split ground plane thing going on. So I guess it's possible. So let's pop this in. Of course, me changing that sound chip probably didn't help, but um, let's pop it in. Turn on the power supply here. All right, and to temporarily ground this, I'll just connect right there onto that loop and I'm gonna connect onto the metal shield that's on the bottom of the power supply. And let's plug in the keyboard. This is not gonna fix this problem because the sound output never worked from the headphone jack either, but let's try it. No sound, okay. So yeah, that was not the problem. I can definitely say that the ground on the audio circuitry is isolated from the ground on the digital circuitry here. So it, it is also connected to the shielding here um, on the um, back of the computer, which means that this motherboard probably would have similar issues. If the sound chip worked, the regular classic motherboard also would probably not play sound through the internal speaker on the um, computer here but it, it should still work through the headphone jack. I, I can't confirm that for sure because this motherboard has no working sound, but yeah, just keep that in mind. Any Anything you work on with the Classic, you're gonna need to connect those grounds together. I cut the wires off the battery and I connected it to a 2032 holder, a little heat shrink. I did peel off the Velcro as well. So that way I can just stick the battery onto there like so, and that should be good. I think it's not gonna go anywhere. Now let's see if this PDS network card is working. And let's turn it on. There it is, sounds good. All right, the Classic has booted up and it's working well, seemingly. Now I do have to admit that the repair work that I've done on this machine was actually back in November, 2020. I was working on other projects like Dossember, but I actually left off by putting the motherboard in the machine, as you just saw, and I put the battery on it, and then I, I made sure it worked, and it did, and then I put it aside. So I am glad that it's still working. As a reminder, this machine has 36 megabytes of RAM in here, which means it should be enough for me to run something like Netscape Navigator. Let's just check on the network. Uh, where is it? TCP IP, make sure that it is recognizing the server, or sorry, the ethernet says using DHCP, does show ethernet. Now, I didn't install any drivers in here. I just put that card in here. Seems to be recognizing it. Now, if I go to uh, a chooser, will that show Apple Share? Okay, that doesn't show anything. I don't have an Apple Share server running right now. I'm not even sure how to see what network card is being used. I mean, there's a token ring <laughs> option here. Okay, I don't have a token ring adapter but there is nothing called networking in here. So this system install, I am pretty sure I have what's called open transport installed. I think, you know, I'm not super familiar with the, this version of Mac OS and what TCP IP stacks exist. I know there was a couple different ones you could have, Mac TCP and then open transport. This one has open transport on it. So let's, let's run Netscape Navigator. Let's see what happens. Netscape 3.0. Sure, why don't we run the latest version? 
I'm not sure if there's even enough RAM for this, but hopefully there is. All right, now this is working. So I don't know what this is, it's milk.com, it's this website. And um, the reason why this is in here is because I ran this browser before on a different Mac that has ethernet that works. And I found that this was a web page that was very old looking, like, like time more back to the 90s. So if we click on some of this stuff, this is absolutely loading. Oh, we're getting errors here. JavaScript errors, JavaScript music demo. Okay, well, I don't think that's gonna work. This is definitely loading off of the internet. Like, I mean, I can let's, I can go to google.com. It's, it's not gonna work because the, you know, the, the certificates and everything on here are not good. This doesn't support TLS, I doubt. It's probably only SSL. Uh, yeah, no common encryption algorithms. It's definitely hitting google.com though. It's just the SSL is not compatible because this is probably SSL v2 or v1 or whatever this supports. But this milk.com, there's no encryption here. Let's just click on a few things here. Is milk.com a commercial ISP? Moo. Hmm. 90% body odor. What is this stuff? Like the date right here, 7th of September, 1993. So this web page is exactly the kind of thing that someone might be browsing on a computer like this. But anyhow, what this shows is the ethernet absolutely works. And with the 68040 in here, this isn't too slow to use, at least on, on old web pages like this. It's pretty boring. Are there any like photographs or something we can find here? Let's see here. Uh, the stories, what's the stories? Unix for the masses. Uh, this looks like Usenet posts or emails or something like that. Dan's favorite recipes. Cranberry tort. There it is. There's the recipe for cranberry tort. If you want to see this stuff yourself, go check out milk.com. I don't know anything about this site other than it's old and it it's not encrypted and it, it renders perfectly on an old computer like this. I love it. I have a copy of NCSA Telnet on here, which is a Macintosh Telnet application. Why don't we try Telnetting to a BBS? Open connection. I am gonna to try to connect to a random BBS that I just found on the telnetbbsguide.org, therac.org. Connection cannot be open because the domain is invalid. Well, I just tried it on my phone, it does connect. So that is the Mac not resolving, but uh, let's just try something internal to my network. All right, I'm connected to my core switch and this is showing just the port status on the various things, it's absolutely working. So it's weird that this program is not able to resolve anything with DNS when clearly Netscape Navigator was having no issues. Oh, look at this program here, Network Software Selector, Classic Networking or Open Transport. So I'm thinking that that NCSA Telnet program perhaps doesn't support Open Transport, and that is why DNS resolution wasn't working, but yet in Netscape, it was working fine. What you see here is a Commodore 64 emulator for the Mac. And even though the 68040 is pretty fast, this emulator is not so great. So let's just try something. Hello world. Um, let's put that with a, that. Oh no, how do I do a semicolon? There we go, it's this one. 20, the keyboard mapping, I'll move the cursor. Keyboard mapping is, is like a 64 keyboard, like um, quotation mark is shift two. So it doesn't match what I'm looking at on the Mac keyboard. You just have to know what a 64 keyboard looks like. But yeah, you can see that the screen update rate is really slow for whatever reason. Dates, let's see, here's uh, Ultima 6. Now let's see, is this really uh, load? Let's see what's on here. Let's see if this is actually Ultima 6. Can't imagine this is gonna work very well. I guess it is, so let's try this out. I think I have to do 8 comma 1 to make this work. There we go, auto started. Is there sound? It says here 75%, so I assume this is running at 75% normal speed. And this game does have a fast loader, so it should load. Now I would imagine back in the day, running this on your Mac would be pretty cool, even the, if the update speeds weren't so slow. If you're running a productivity app, like you need to get some of your data out of here, that was usable still. But whether this can actually run any games, yeah, I don't know. And it probably didn't take it, it probably was until PowerPC based Macintoshes 
before you could really run these emulators at least at a decent speed. I think this is just not going to work. Let's try and access the disk. I'll let this go and see what happens. All right, well, this has been running for quite a while and it's not doing anything. So, so I assume this thing just, the compatibility probably really sucks on it. Here's a program called JPEG View. Let's open this up. Now, one thing that's really funny about JPEGs is they're actually quite intensive to look at. So I have a picture folder here and I copied a few things onto here. Let's load a JPEG here. Uh, there's one called Kids and watch how slow this is. Watch this. So it has to reduce it to 256 colors. It's probably a pretty low resolution image and we're just loading one JPEG and look how slow it is. We take this for granted now that JPEGs load instantly on our phones, on our computers, whatever. But for a long time, it took that long to load a single file. Let's see if we can figure out the image size here. Here we are. This is a 24 bit JPEG, of course, and the resolution is 937 by 838. So not even close to like 1080p and it took that long to load this one thing. Now it, it did reduce it to 256 colors. I am running this machine in 256 color mode and it looks pretty great, right? Let's uh, let's go to normal size, which I think, oh, it has to re decompress it again. See, so it says decompress it at the bottom there. Interesting. I was gonna go to full screen so we could really get a good look at what some good dithering on 256 colors can look like. Okay, that didn't actually do anything. Anyhow, we'll do full screen. Take this, take a look at this. Let's close this once we can. We're just loading one picture and it takes this long. So just remember that things weren't quite so fast in the old days. Now, web pages really didn't use JPEGs. They were GIFs because GIFs or GIFs loaded very quickly compared to JPEGs. And they were the format of the internet for the longest time. And then JPEGs started to be able to be used in line because computer processing power increased. But look at that, if I saw this, Back in the day, after using a black and white Mac for years and years, if you got a color classic and you were able to render a JPEG and look at that picture, that looks really good. I can see a little bit of dithering, but ultimately, considering this is 256 colors, this is pretty striking. And I can imagine that on the original processor on this thing, that picture opening probably took five times longer. Remember the benchmarks we ran showing that this processor was five times faster? Well, that's the kind of thing where the improvement is dramatic. Gotta say though, this computer really works well now. i um, been playing around with it. Here's the game Maelstrom. Uh, I'm gonna turn the volume down a little bit because it has some sound. I'm pushing the button on the front of the machine. Because the resolution is the same as the Mac LC machines, the LC1 and LC2 and 3, there were a lot of software packages that were eventually designed to run with this resolution. I think originally, let me turn the volume down here. Um, originally when this resolution came out, not a lot of stuff supported it because Macintosh's forever, the color ones had all been 640 by 480. And then later the LC came out and nothing supported, but then eventually all the games and stuff did support that resolution. In fact, a lot of games are natively at that resolution. When you run them on a Mac that has a higher resolution, you get a black border around the edge, which is not particularly great. And this is like an Asteroids type game. Uh, let's see, how do I move? Oh, oh, I died. Okay, I'm playing at an awkward angle with the camera in the way, so it's a little hard. But uh, I think I remember playing this game back in the day. I didn't have a Mac. I had an Amiga at the time of this when this was out. There we go, that's cute. Yeah, so everything is working great. So I think at this point, time to just put that back cover on the back, button this thing up and do my conclusions on it. All right, so if I tilt this up, uh, there's the network card and that was working great. And the rest of this thing, is just fine now. So this is the 3D printed back panel that I printed. Notice the black filaments, but I've painted it. And I think at this point, I, I printed this maybe a month and a half ago. I'd say this paint and the clear coat is totally dry. I just need to clip off this little part of the bracket so that the ethernet port can stick through. I was gonna try to clip that out with these fake Play-Dohs here. And I just, um, I didn't wanna do it on the painted side. It might scratch it up and I couldn't get it through the little cracks there. So I'm gonna get the cutting board out and I'm going to use this utility knife here and hopefully not make a mess of this thing. I think I'm getting there. Oh, there we go. That came out finally. I'm gonna use the dead parts bin to tilt up the machine so we can all get a better camera view of it. 
There we go. All right, so the original cover that went on here had like plastic clips, so it would hinge on from the bottom and then clip on. So you didn't need the screws. But this one obviously doesn't have those plastic clips. So when I put this on, I'm gonna need some kind of screws to hold this in. But there it is, it completely fits properly. And the alignment seems okay as well. And the color match, as you just noticed, it's, yeah, it's a little more of a kind of a creamy color than the platinum on the Mac itself. And this Mac has very minimal yellowing, but let's just put a couple screws in there. Now I'm not exactly sure which screw pitch or thread pitch Apple used here, but I have these little thumb screws from a PC case and it would be really nice if I could use these. Nope, those are, I don't think those are even long enough. So those, those didn't even engage. All right, well, I found these screws in my parts bin. They're long, they look fine, metal type thread pitch, I don't know. And let's, it, it went in over here on this side, okay. And they do need to be long, otherwise it will not engage. Yep, that's working. That is working, everyone. So this Color Classic now has a nice 3D printed back panel that's actually held on and it's held on tightly, excellent. For anyone who's interested in what colors I used, I used this as the color paint. So Rust-Oleum Painter's Touch Paint Plus Primer. And I, I don't know, Satin Smoky Beige. Okay, so that's this color. That was the color. I put multiple coats. I can't remember how many it was, maybe four or five coats of that. And then this was the cover up I used or the enamel, matte clear enamel. Or, you know, it might've been a satin one that I used. I have a few of these and I, I can't quite remember. And I guess it does have a sort of satiny sheen to it, which I, I thought would match this a little bit, like the texture of the original plastic. So I haven't done a lot of testing with this clear enamel here. And I'm curious is how tough is it? Because if it was just the paint, you, you could scratch it with your fingernails. Well, it's definitely resisting my fingernails. If I try to scratch this with my nail, I can look at different angles and I don't see any marks at all. Now, what about something like this, this uh, ADB cable? And that's because of course, you know, you'll be, I could possibly be trying to connect this and moving around and I might scratch this up. So let's just see. All right, well, that does put little scratch marks in there. I don't know how those are coming across. Um, definitely, okay, so there, yeah, it scratched it pretty hard. But this connector is quite sharp. It's got a little beveled edge there. In fact, if I really try, I can really make some scratch marks. I think that'll hold up pretty well. I'm just, you know, be careful not to jam the cable in and be, be reckless about it. And if I do, no big deal. It gets a little bit of scratches like that on it. No big deal. Well, summary time. I have the Color Classic set up on the bench right next to the Macintosh 128. This was the first machine ever released by Apple, first Macintosh machine ever released by Apple. And this was the last classic form factor, you know, in this form factor, Macintosh ever released by Apple. So quite the lineage here from the very first to the very last. Of course, you know, we're still with Macintoshes today, but none of them are in this particular form factor with the handle, the disk drive here in the same spot. A lot of similarities between these two machines. It's pretty cool to see the change. Of course, color being one of the main ones, but 68040 processor in here means that this thing flies compared to this. I mean, what? How many times faster is a 68040 than the 68000 in here? I don't know off the top of my head, but many, many times. Although a Macintosh Classic, the regular Classic, not the Classic 2, is very similar in performance to this first machine. Very little changed from this machine, which came out in 84, all the way to the Classic, which I think was on sale still in 1991. But this one, on the other hand, of course, is taking advantage of modern technology at the time in the 90s there with that 040 and the high color screen. And of course, the nice Trinitron picture tube was a real upgrade. And I know when I had one of these Macs back in the day when I was a kid, Mac SE is what we had in our family, I dreamed of an upgrade where I could get a color screen into a classic Mac. I just never thought that would be possible. And I didn't actually know about these color classics until much later in life, well, once I had sort of moved on and these were now kind of old anyways, I've realized at that point that these existed. But by the time I had switched over to the Amiga and then onto PCs, I, I stopped paying attention to the Macintosh line pretty much. And I never had actually seen one of these machines in person until this computer was donated to me originally with all that rust inside. 
And now that it works, a uh, huge thanks to Kale for sending in the original motherboard for this. Unfortunately, I couldn't get that working. And then Tekokami for sending in the Mystic upgrade, which has resulted in this thing being an amazing little computer. So there we go. I hope you enjoyed this video series and all the repairs I had to do with this, including some things that even I learned about RF shields breaking things when you take them off. I know people are going to laugh in the comments about that because I, I do take those off quite a lot. I have never encountered a Mac where taking it off prevented it from working or any machine for that matter. Anyhow, if you enjoyed this video, I would appreciate a thumbs up, but if you didn't, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button to subscribe to my channel with the little notification icon uh, to let you get notified when I upload new videos. Definitely helps the channel when you do that and put your comments and your suggestions in the comment section below. I really appreciate that as well. That's gonna be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.